Thank you, Peter, for reading Psalm 46 for us so powerfully. Well, it's the first Sunday in uh, 2024, if you believe it. And the new year, it's always a time, isn't it, for looking back uh, and for looking forward. Looking back over the last year at the things that have happened, at what God's been doing in our lives this last year. Looking back and looking forward, anticipating what's coming, wondering what God wants for us, is wanting for us this year, uh, and what God's saying to us at the threshold of this new year. And somehow this year feels different, not just because as a church we're looking forward to a visit from Dan Tyler this next week, though we are, but, well, I don't know what it's been like for you, but as I've been writing Christmas cards this year, I, I found myself feeling a bit uneasy. The idea of wishing people a happy Christmas has, ha has had a bit of an edge to it somehow, when you know that some people are facing really painful and difficult situations. And when the very atmosphere that we're breathing day by day as, as we read the news is filled with anxiety, more than nervousness, with anxiety and sometimes with fear. Fear for our world, wondering what might be coming over the horizon at us. As I've written those Christmas messages this year, I've felt that what I've really been saying is, have the best Christmas you can in the circumstances. And with all of those mixed emotions, we come on this first Sunday of the new year to Psalm 46. And if ever there was a psalm for our times, this is it. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even if the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. We um, have friends whose older son is spending a year in Japan. And uh, last Monday, he found himself just a couple of hours from the epicenter of the earthquake that shook Japan on, on New Year's Eve. And of course, that stirred up for people there the terrifying memories of the earthquake of 2011 that killed 20,000 people and that you'll remember caused the meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. I've never felt the earth giving way under my feet. I've never heard a, a tsunami crashing ashore as the waters roar and foam. But it must be terrifying, mustn't it? And when I read about things like in this psalm, the earth giving way and the mountains crashing into the sea, well, I can't help but think of those dire warnings the climate scientists are giving about environmental breakdown, ice cliffs falling into the heart of the sea, sea levels rising, storm surges increasing, and ever more flooding and destruction across the world. This psalm takes us out of the comfort of being here in church into the sometimes frightening world that God so loves. But... But even as the psalmist faces the worst that could happen, he still affirms, we will not fear. Even though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea and its waters roar and foam. Because the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And it's not just environmental disasters that this psalm talks about, it's the nations too. Did you catch it in verse 6? Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. And of course you think of Israel and Gaza, the Ukraine, Yemen, Sudan, 
the increasing threats from China, North Korea threatening to destroy the South with its nuclear weapons, conflict in Mali and Myanmar, in Lebanon, I could go on and on and on. As we begin 2024, the world feels, and perhaps is, in an ever more precarious place. And yet, in the midst of it all, the psalmist says, and we dare to say with the psalmist, we will not fear. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Psalm 46 gives us this repeated refrain, and it's the faith of the psalmist and of his community that we join with as we affirm our trust in God. But in this psalm, we don't only hear the psalmist's faith. In this psalm, we hear the very voice of God, the call Yahweh, thundering through the tumult, breaking through the panic and the uproar and the chaos, and declaring, be still, and know that I am God. And you know, if, if, if my voice can't do a Connie, how can my voice possibly carry the voice of God? Because this isn't a gentle patting you on the back, don't worry sort of voice. This voice cuts through the uproar with the authority and the authenticity of one who is even more powerful than the chaos. Be silent, be still, stop what you're doing, stop in your tracks, and know that I am here, and I am God. I remember as a teenager and as a, a very young Christian being at our church's prayer meeting, weekly prayer meeting, uh, the very first time somebody gave a, a word of prophecy. Uh, somebody spoke with words that, that, that came straight from the heart of God to that group that night. And, and you just knew it was God. It had a beauty, it had a Godness about it that, 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 that just impacted you, and you knew it was God. But you know, more than that, I remember walking home from, from the church that night after the prayer meeting and catching myself looking over my shoulder just to see if God might be following me. I mean, it's one thing to sing our songs and to pray our prayers, but when God, as if it, it sort of taps you on the shoulder and says, I really am here, you know. I really am listening. Well, I, I was suddenly so much more aware of how real and how present God is. One of the cartoons I remember watching when I was young, and this is going back a long time, was Sinbad the Sailor. Do any of you remember Sinbad the Sailor? Uh, stories that come from the Arabian Nights. And one of these cartoon episodes I particularly remember was about Sinbad landing on an island, a desert island. Uh, and he made his camp on this desert island and set up a camp there and lit a fire. And um, after he'd done that, something happened which took Sinbad totally by surprise. There was Sinbad, relieved to be on terra firma at last, when the island began to, to move, to shake beneath his feet. And no, it wasn't an earthquake. An earthquake. What Sinbad discovered was that what he thought was an island wasn't just an island at all. It was actually a sleeping whale that he'd landed on and that just decided to, to move as it began to get warmed up. And of course, the whale had been there all the time, hadn't it? The whale had been there, but now it revealed its presence it woke Sinbad up to its presence. Now, that may be a very silly analogy, and please forgive me if it is, but it's a bit like that with God, isn't it? The truth is that the Lord Almighty is 
always with us, that the God of Jacob is always our fortress. But there are moments when God reminds us, reminds us of his living presence with us. And that's what God's doing with us this morning. The voice of God erupts for us through this psalm, saying to us, be still, just stop and know that I am God. I am God, the great I am. I am God and I am here. I am with you. At the beginning of this new year, God comes to us to remind us how truly present he is. Can you feel the warmth of his breath around you, within you? Can you hear the beats of his heart beating with love for his world? Can you sense the hush of his presence? The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Hallelujah. God is with us and God is for us. I love the way in this psalm and throughout scripture, God identifies himself as the God of Jacob. And those of you who know your Old Testament will know that Jacob was the younger twin who was born grasping the heel of his big brother. And it went on from there, really. Jacob was the jealous, the ambitious younger son who stole his birthright from his older brother. And not to put too fine a point on it, Jacob was a chief. I don't think there are any perfect families in the Bible, but Jacob's family certainly wasn't one of them. Jacob cheated his older brother out of his rightful inheritance. He broke his parents' hearts, and then he ran away from it all. But God ran with him. God didn't wash his hands of Jacob. He didn't abandon him. No, God revealed the tenacity and the power of his love in pursuing this messed up, mixed up human being, and then taking him and making him nothing less than the father of the nation. In Jacob, God reveals a love that will never give up, a love that will never give up on even far from perfect people like Jacob and like the rest of us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Which means, do you see, that God is not only with us, but God is for us. No matter how badly or how often we mess up, no matter how badly or how often this chaotic world that seems so bent on self-destruction messes up, God has not and will not abandon us. God has not left us to the chaos that we let loose. God is with us, and God is for us, and God will get us there. This psalm reminds us of God's presence, of God's unfailing and invincible love. But this psalm also points us forward towards God's future. There in verse 8, Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. And desolations there could be in inverted commas, really, because in contrast to the violence and the bloodshed that we let loose, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says... Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God will get us there. Whatever words we use to describe where there is, whether we talk about heaven, about God's kingdom, about the future God will bring, about that day when God will wipe away every tear from every eye and there will be no more death, 
or mourning or crying or pain, that day when all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. God will get us there. God will get us there. So be still. Stop your panicking. Stop, says God, and trust me. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God is with his world. God is for his world. God is at work in his world. And God knows what he's doing. One last story. I uh, woke up uh, uh, a few years ago, and before I was even properly awake, in that time when I was sort of half awake and half asleep and still coming to, it was as if I'd opened the inbox in my mind, and suddenly all these emails came tumbling in, all these things that, that needed to be done that demanded my attention. Now, I, I love my work, but it didn't stop it, sometimes feeling all a bit overwhelming. But something happened that morning. That morning, in those moments between being fully asleep and fully awake, God spoke with a clarity he very rarely does. Maybe with me, he very rarely gets the chance. But God spoke with a clarity that morning, with a clarity and an authority. And what God said was, the important thing today isn't what you've got to do. The important thing is what I am doing. And you know, I felt as if I'd been picked up by the scruff of the neck and given a good shake and sat down again. Oh, in love, most definitely in love, but most definitely given a good shake. This morning, God comes to give us a good shake. In love, almost definitely in love, but definitely a good shake. This morning, God comes to remind us that he is with us, that he is for us, that he knows the future and that he will get us there. Next Sunday, as David's already said, Dan Tyler will be here. He and Emily may well be with us on live link this morning, but I think it's probably heading up to midnight in New Zealand, so maybe they'll wait till tomorrow, who knows. But as Dan gets on that plane, and I'm sure emotionally Emily will get on that plane with him, we will surround them, won't we, with our prayers all the way until he's back with them again. And as, ben, as Dan spends time here with the church, we'll be getting to know him. But, you know, there's only one question we're really asking. And it's not, is he my sort of minister? It's not, is he the perfect minister? Are they the perfect couple? Are they what we expected? And for Dan and Emily, too, it's not... Is this the perfect church? Some hope for any of us, really, because none of us are, are we? Though they may be asking, is this a church we could love? But for all of us, the only real question is, has God been at work preparing us for one another? Is God bringing these two stories together, Dan and Emily and their family story, and the story of Haywards Heath Baptist Church. And we look forward to finding that out, don't we? We look forward to that process of discernment with a confidence that God will show us the way ahead. We look forward with confidence because we know that the God of all creation, the very Lord of life, is the God who is with us and for us. We look forward with confidence because we know that the God of all creation is the God who knows what he's doing. And we are called, called to stop fighting to be in control ourselves, 
we are called to put our hands into the hands of God and to step out into all that 2024 holds for us in confidence, trusting in God who says to us, be still and know that I am God. The Lord Almighty is with us. You're allowed to join me in saying that. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's just take a moment of